I welcome everybody. This, my name is Paul Carlos. I'm a board member at the Type Directors Club and joining us today is Carol Waller, our executive director, and Karen Cheng, today's speaker. All right, so I'm gonna start at least with the stuff about the TDC. So again, welcome all. Um, as I said, Paul Carlos, board member at the TDC. So we're very excited to have, um, to announce our upcoming TDC conference. It's please save the date, May 7th and 8th. So uh, join us online on Friday, May 7th and Saturday, May 8th for two half days of talks, presentations, and group discussions spanning design disciplines across local and global communities. The conference will highlight communities that use typography to pursue a common purpose, establish intergenerational connections, and spark and sustain change. Um, if you become a member when conference registration is open, you'll automatically get a ticket to the conference. Um, next Thursday, March 11th, a history of graphic design with Bahia Shahab and Haitham Nawar. That's from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. Um, people are still coming in, but I'm going to start Karen's because I want to give her full time, the full hour here. Uh, I want to welcome Professor Karen Cheng. She's a multidisciplinary designer and is the author of Designing Type, the reason why we're all here today a comprehensive systematic guide to the design of letters published by Yale University Press. Since its publication in 2006, Designing Type has been translated into German, Spanish, French, Chinese, and Korean. And maybe that's why there's so many people around the world today. And it has been ranked number 14 on a list of top 50 typograph typography books. I should learn how to say the word typography, shouldn't I? Uh, books of the last 50 years in the journal Visible Language. Um, Karen has a master's degree in design from University of Cincinnati. Uh, prior to joining the faculty of UW in 97, she worked in brand management at Procter & Gamble, and she has also worked at Studio Matthews in Seattle. So I want to welcome Karen Cheng to the TDC. Take it away, Karen. Thanks so much for that nice introduction. And thanks to both Paul and Carol for um, inviting me to give this talk. I have a lot of um, respect and love for the TDC. I remember in grad school, like always waiting for the annual to come out and then like pouring over each one, you know, and so forth. So it's a great organization. I'm glad, you know, things are still going and uh, going smoothly with the pandemic. Um, so, um, I'm coming in here from Seattle, and it's actually the beginning of spring here. So, I teach at the University of Washington, and this is uh, one of the iconic shots of the university. This is the quad during the cherry tree blossoms. But I'm pretty confident it's going to rain later today, and most of the time the university does kind of look like this, in which it's just kind of rain, rain, rain. You know, so, um, so yeah, I'm here to talk about my book, Designing Type, which was first published here in 2006, actually. Um, so um, I was lucky enough to have a chance to make a second edition 15 years later. So it's just kind of amazing to see, you know, all the changes in type that have happened over a decade and a half. So uh, what I thought I'd do for this particular talk is basically answer five questions that come up about the book. Um, like, uh, so the third question is kind of the longest actually. And so we'll probably take up like 15 minutes of the talk. The other questions are relatively short. So I think it will be about a 40 minute talk or so. So the first question that often comes up, and these cards are from pre-pandemic when I passed out um, some note cards to different classes and asked, you know, what questions would you like to hear me talk about if I uh, was going to give a talk on my book? Um, and people ask, well, why'd you write a book? And so this is a quote that I love by Tori, Toni Morrison that talks about, you know, if there's a book that you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, you must be the one to write it. So I guess it's kind of crazy, but I wound up writing this book because I needed a book like this. Um, so I have to kind of explain that, um, as uh, Paul said, um, 
I went to school at the University of Cincinnati. And so I was actually there during the time that they were constructing the crazy DAP building. I see that Kelly Salco um, is also on this call. And so her father taught there. He was one of my professors and we're both alums of this illustrious institution. And so when I was there, uh, one of the first classes I took was a type design class with Heinz Schenker, who you see here. Um, Heinz uh, is a is a alumni of the Basel School of Design, um, and so he. Uh, um, he taught the type design class and he actually became my mentor. He was a very generous and like wonderful person. And so I remember I was always amazed in his class because he would come in with nothing, no notes, nothing. And then he would get a piece of chalk at the chalkboard and he would go through all the different letters and talk about anatomical variations. So you see, you see him doing that there. And so we were basically supposed to take notes in our notebook, and I actually still have my notebook, um, you know, and then draw the letters ourselves. So you can see this little close up here where he showed us, you know, okay, there are different ways to attach the tail to the cue that you could put it inside, you could overlap it, it could just be tangent on the bottom, right? Um, and he told us not to be timid, <laughs> which is actually very good advice for a cue. Um, so what happened is when I was, uh, after I was a graduate student and I graduated, there was a small um, school in Cincinnati called the Art Academy of Cincinnati. And it was part of um, a museum in Cincinnati called the, you know, Cincinnati Art Museum. And so this is an overhead shot of it in Eden Park. And so it was actually quite beautiful. Like there's this big green area in Cincinnati and the museum's really kind of situated in a lovely um, setting. So you can see it was actually originally a museum school. In these photos, you can see this was the museum and then back here was the school. So you can see, you know, the museum was revised several times to become this kind of classic bow art structure. And then it looks like, you know, they absorbed the school to a certain extent. I think you had to come around the other side in order to go to the school. So I think in many ways, it was a very, um, you know, kind of gentle sort of um, community art school. You can see in this vintage photograph that there were women sketching on the steps and children and so forth. And that, you know, it had a certain kind of villagey kind of quality, you know, here. Um, so I had wasn't nearly as confident as Heinz, and I really wanted to teach it well. So I thought I'd get a book, like a textbook. And I remember I asked Heinz, like, okay, what are the good books? And he mentioned this book, which I still have, this lettering for reproduction. And this is actually a beautiful book, like, you know, and it does cover some of the things, like, you know, proportion of the different letters, and then how to draw them with like a pencil that you would chisel into sort of a calligraphic tool. Okay. Then here, you know, and there are some, you know, very fine examples of craft, you know, here, this sort of, you know, sans serif drawing. Um, there was another book, which I found, but I was ashamed to mention this to Heinz because it was so American commercial art, but there was this a uh, lettering for advertising book by Mortimer Leach. Like there's an American 1950s name for you, right? Um, and he did kind of a similar thing. And in fact, I know that um, even today, designers still look at this stuff because I found these particular images on Flickr on the Klim Type Foundry Flickr page, you know. So again, you know, really fine, you know, uh, examples of like lettering by hand. Um, but they weren't quite what I wanted because I think they were designed for people who were doing this kind of work. This is an example from the Letterform Archive, which is a wonderful place in San Francisco. Like, I would like to be locked in there at night, uh, you know. So by the book designer, um, you know, Philip Grushkin. So you can see, you know, prior to computers, people had to draw the type that they wanted, especially display type. And so, you know, you would draw it as well as you could by hand. It it would be photographed and then used on book covers like this. Um, I considered using Letters of Credit, which is a completely text-based book talking about, you know, maybe philosophies of type design. Again, a fairly American industrialist perspective. But to be honest, I found this book sort of tedious reading on my own. So the idea of assigning this to this like Art Academy audience felt really wrong. Um, the one book I think I did wind up recommending is the Rookledge Type Finder, which you never sort of see anymore. 
um, you know, but basically this was prized by type designers, even though it was originally intended as like a lookup tool. Basically, you can see here that they would show various kind of what they called signature, signature identifying marks of letters. Then you could go back and look up the typeface. So it was literally a type finder. You know, nowadays, of course, we have the Internet. But back then it was like, oh, better get this book. You know, plus this preface by Adrian Frutiger is quite nice, actually. Um, so because there wasn't a book I particularly wanted, um, I wound up making my own sort of handouts. And of course, this is, you know, like I thought, OK, I'll make them square because you know, why? <laughs> so, but originally I thought it would be, they would all be square and there'd be a series of cards about the book. So you can see here, like I was talking about how to draw a roll, you know, old Roman O. I still have these little card mock-ups. Um, and part of the benefit of this was for me, it was actually a big crutch, but I could also feel like I didn't have to prove to the students that I knew what I was talking about because I was showing them in black and white, you know, like see how here in this Baskerville, you can see that the maximum thickness of the O is larger than the maximum vertical stem thickness of the E. So I didn't have to tell them or draw it precisely on the chalkboard. I could give them this, you know, handout and they'd be like, oh, okay, I see what she's talking about. Okay. And I guess part of this approach, it, you probably stem from the fact that I studied science before becoming a designer. I have an undergrad degree from Penn State in chemical engineering because my parents were both scientists. My dad's a civil engineer. My mom's a physicist. And, you know, like most Asian families, they were like, you kids will become engineers or doctors. So I became an engineer. My sister is a doctor. You know, that was basically, you know, the way these things worked. And so I think that basically I had this kind of idea that that, you know, letter forms were like molecules, you know, that I could take them apart, I could put them back together, I could see how they were constructed, and that that was all it would take to kind of learn about type. I see now that that was very flawed, like very rationalist, but at the time... Um... Karen? Oh, I'm, yeah, okay. I'm so okay. sorry about that. Are we back? Yeah, yes, we're sorry. back. It's, it's a... I'm sorry, my internet has been a little weird. I wasn't sure if I should try to go to the university or not. Okay, so are we, is it good? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, great. So I was saying how like, um, so at the University of Cincinnati, basically they had this great library. And so there were things you could read. And so there was, um, this was an amazing book, this origin of the seraph, so dry actually. It's written by a priest actually, who researched all this, um, you know, but, and also of course, Doyle Young's book came out, Fonts and Logos, and that was a huge influence on me. And so, of course, this made for like a really strange diet uh, in terms of like uh, balance, because, you know, like at the time, like emigre was really huge and that would come out every issue. And there was so much to see and think about there. Um, but also Heinz, you know, my Swiss mentor, he was like, have you seen TM magazine? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and I was like, oh, neat. And that was really neat, too. You know, but those two things couldn't have come from like more different philosophies and so forth. Okay, so uh, some of the, um, like I was trying to explain this during a podcast I was on, uh, there used to be this thing called the Design and Applied Arts Index, which I'm showing on the right. It was basically a reader's guide and they would publish a couple uh, versions of it every year. And basically they would tell you what, uh, periodicals, like you could look up type design or things like that, or Matthew Carter, and it would tell you, okay, these magazines have published articles on it. And then through, you know, really tedious interlibrary loan procedure, you could get scans or, you know, get the magazine article. Um, and then of course, it was amazing to discover at that time, I Magazine, um, you know, Rick Pointer was then, I guess, in charge and every year they would do a type issue. And that was really amazing stuff. You know, so, and of course, I went to my first A Type I conference in 2003 when they were in Vancouver uh, because that was the, um, you know, the main, uh, you know, that was close to me and that was great. And there used to be um, a, uh, online forum called Typeophile, and that was amazing too. So these were all the like super early days. Um, but because you, um, 
because, uh, you know, there was so, so much restriction and, you know, I wasn't part of a program like the University of Reading or KABK, um, you know, it was kind of patchy. So in a weird way, making these diagrams was actually the primary way that I researched the book. In other words, like I I didn't know that much about type design. So like I would do things um, to kind of prove what Heinz had told me. Like he'd be like, hey, you know, the I of the E is not symmetrical. So I would actually get the E out and then I would dissect it. I'd be like, oh yeah, he's right. Like this side's different from this side. Or then I would, and then some things I didn't understand. I thought like, oh, the E and the C would be exactly the same, but that's not true. If you put the E over the C, the weight's in a slightly different area. So of course, and, you know, I was like, are they all that way? So it's like, okay, let's look at another one. So I'll look at, you know, I looked for typefaces I thought were classic or good, like Stemple Garamond. I was like, what about them? They have a tilted O, how does it look? And then I would say, oh, okay, that's what it's doing. And then I'd be like, oh, better check some other ones. You know, <laughs> so I'd be like, okay, so New Romans, those are more similar. You could see the weight in the E and the C is always lower than that in the O for these, for example. You know, what about these kinds of letters that have have like the underbite, you know, and so forth. So it was kind of a, so actually this became kind of the way I was trying to look at type. And again, I see that there are flaws in this kind of method, you know, and that you pick up on things that maybe aren't intentional or that artifacts in, um, you know, the fact that some of these types had to be fitted for the linotype or the monotype systems in certain ways that they weren't always the way their creators would have wanted them. You know, but basically by doing this, you know, because I was teaching at the Art Academy and then later I moved to, to uh, Seattle here and I was teaching here that it works out pretty well because there's, you know, like all the letters and you just keep doing one at a time, you know. So, um, yeah. So here's the biggest part. And actually, I was, great. I was really pleased, Andrea, to see that you're on the call here because it says here, you know, so basically, um, as you asked, like, OK, how do you use the book? So basically, now I don't lecture at all because I ask the students to buy the book and I try not to make money off their purchase. I say, like, you can get a used copy from the previous class and so forth, you know, and I donate the proceeds from the UW bookstore, um, you know, so it's not like you're making money off the students themselves. Um, but basically, Basically, they can read the book on their own, so I don't have to lecture, or take up valuable lecture time, and we can just do a type project. Um, so when I first started uh, teaching type, I did it exactly the way they did it at Cincinnati. Like, uh, this is actually my Cincinnati work. It's like kind of embarrassing to look at it now. You can see that, you know, my two isn't very nice or the leg of my R is kind of timid and a little awkward. Um, you can see Heinz here, his drawings on the side, trying to show me how to make a better, um, you know, thrust to my M, you know. But uh, he would have us draw all these letters. Uh, this is a pretty big board. I think it was maybe 24 by 24. So these are just my sketches. I don't actually have the, um, the, the boards anymore, but you would have to draw the letters and you can see my like frantic um, sort of squaring up with the T square, you know, and so you had to do, I think, old Roman, new Roman, slab serif and sans serif. And you see my sans is particularly crummy <laughs> because it was at the end and I didn't have a, you know, as much chance to refine it. Uh, and so actually at that time you had to paint the board and placa. So on the board, you would wash it over with all white paint. Then you would transfer your drawing using graphite, you know, to the front of the board. Then you would paint the letters with the black placa. And if you messed up, you would go over it with the white placa to kind of erase your mistake. Um, but I was at Cincinnati during the great placa shortage of the 90s when I guess there was some kind of strike at the Pelican plant or something. So we couldn't get placa. So I think I wound up using some kind of acrylic. Okay, so when I came to uh, Seattle, I did the same thing. I was like, okay, kids can draw the letters. I know exactly how to do this. I broke the letters down into different groups. I did just exactly as I have been taught, like you do the capitals first, which isn't actually, I found it the way type designers do it. They do the lowercase first, actually. And even when the capitals, they don't begin with the E and the O, they begin with the H and the O, you know? So like, I didn't know these things, you know? And then we did the lowercase afterwards, right? So here's some examples of student work work at that time, you know, like, a, again, like an old Roman kind of thing, you know, they had to do the numbers as well. 
you know, and then here's, a, you know, the sans serif A's, you know, and then here's a series of G's and so forth. This was the time in which meta was super popular in the 90s, you know, so there was a lot of sort of inspiration from that. So um, I had the students make the boards in Illustrator, you know, because like it seemed ridiculous to like look for placa, you know, and so forth. And I don't think that's really kind of the way uh, students need to learn right now. So the, um, here's some samples of the boards. I was a little freer in terms of like, sometimes I would let them make a display type. This was from an Asian student who was thinking about, could there be Asian characteristics to Latin type? Or, you know, I, they could make a grid-based display type, you know, that kind of thing. But I began to be kind of less happy with this approach because I felt like um, the letters were being very isolated, kind of like the way, you know how in the Olympics they used to have these compulsory figures where I think skaters had to prove that they could make certain shapes on the ice. And that's kind of how I felt what I was doing. Um, and I wanted them to get a different feeling for type, like type as an expressive element. Like you've probably seen these dogs, you know, uh, like this is by the Vienna based studio, Graphis Bureau. I'm not sure I'm saying that right, um, but they produce this kind of wonderful dogs, those fonts. And then you've probably seen, I think this was produced by like Buzzfeed or something, you know, cats as fonts. Like, but this is kind of the thing I was interested in, like did type have a personality? So at the, that time, this book came out in 2003 and this gave me a lot of inspiration. This was a project by um, the University of Minnesota Design Institute, which I don't believe exists anymore, but it was a wonderful project where they invited different type designers to propose a typeface for the Twin Cities. And the idea is that that typeface would be used on posters, publications, event signage, advertisements, and flyers, you know, basically all the things a city would have. During the Design Institute um, week, there was a peak week basically. And this is actually the winning creation, which was by uh, Jess Van uh, Rosum and Eric Blokelin. It was called Twin. And, you know, because they were Dutch, I think it was a super family. So there was this kind of crazy twin loopy variant. And there was also twin weird va variant. I like how they just came right out and said, this is twin weird, <laughs> you know. Um, so I started doing this project in my own class then where I let the students pick any city they wanted and design a typeface for that city. Um, so you can see here, uh, one of the students, this is Sean Douglas's project, he chose Bermuda, which I really didn't understand. I have not been to Bermuda, okay? And so, but then he showed during his presentation, they have this very distinct architectural style, almost like sort of a, ice cream cake, you know, like kind of very decorative gingerbready, you know. And so this is, um, you know, a change like so I had them try to draw some kind of word mark. It pro again, probably would have been better to do it in lowercase, but I was like use uppercase and you can see his ideas for it. You know, and so you can see here, um, you know, his is his final design. This is sort of the architectural details that it comes from. Then we had a different student, James Atkin, who chose this town called Hamilton. He was from Idaho, being out here in the West, you know, like we actually do get quite a lot of students from like Idaho, Alaska, those kinds of things. I found that very exotic when I first moved here, coming from Pennsylvania myself. Um, but the Coeur d'Alene River is actually a big feature of Harrison, this little town. And it used to be a place where there are these steamboats that went back and forth on the river. It's a pretty big um, port, actually. So this was his final design, you know, here of his typeface. And then I see, I think Mike Fredo's on the call. Mike, I would thought I'd show your um, Augie Sands project. Mike Fredo was a wonderful graduate student we had from St. Augustine, Florida. And so he was interested in vernacular of Florida, you know, and so there's basically, you know, all these kind of wonderful hand painted signs there. And so that was his inspiration. And this is his final project where he was, you know, working to kind of translate that into a kind of vernacular sand. Um, and then Felix Wang did this project about Detroit. Um, so he was actually from Detroit, Michigan, um, which was pretty interesting. And so I have to say, I know there's a group here from Wayne State, you know, today. I found Detroit, like a couple times I've been invited by Judith, which is so kind of you. 
um, to be such a wonderful place. Like it's such interesting architecture, these tall, thin houses, you know, such dignity and beauty. You can really see why it was called the Paris of the Midwest. Um, and so this is Felix's project we call it Piquette, which he named after the Piquette Ford Avenue plant, you know, and it has like kind of the same sort of spiky Victorian quality, perhaps as those early Model T's. Um, and so the last city project I'll show you is by um, Kaito Gengo, who now lives in New York, actually, um, but he's originally from Japan and he was interested in Kyoto. Um, and so he talked about Kyoto as being a mix of old and new. You see how it's both, you know, this bustling modern train station and this kind of beautiful old tatami Japanese, you know, character as well. So he says, you know, you see the old and new all the time and it is the cultural capital of Japan in his opinion. You know, so he talked about this as his brief, essentially, that tradition and softness plus modernity, that that would be the Kyoto typeface that he was trying to make. Um, you know, so um, these were some of his sketches where I think he was trying to capture that feeling of like softness and modernity. And he even tried using, you know, different sort of ink brush type strokes. And then this is the final design. I think there's still something not totally resolved about how those soft strokes like meet the letters, but I thought it was such a beautiful idea. Um, okay, so I did this type design project for city type design project for quite some time, um, you know, but to be honest, I actually felt it was too hard. Um, you know, here you can see, I was also teaching it in very small classes. At this time, I was offering type design as an elective. So sometimes as little as six people took it. Look, you can see Kaito here. Everybody looks really miserable on the day of the final because they've stayed up late, you know, and they make these type boards. And that's what changed too. Like I really wanted them to make some kind of output that showed their type in use, not single letters, but actually, you know, spaced and made into a rhythm of text, you know? So, um, you know, but what I mean by difficult is like, even if you look at Seattle, there are these surface things people think about the space needle or the mountains and so forth. Right. And then of course, you know, it's a coffee central kind of place. Starbucks is here, you know, and then it is the home of aviation, you know, Boeing and so forth, you know, like there, you know, there's an interesting piece of type there or maybe here, for example. Um, and then there's things like the market, you know, like the Pike Place market, seafood, fishing and so forth. Right. Um, so I was a little stuck because I kind of felt like, well, I don't know if that type thing is really working. It's very, very difficult, actually, to make a typeface that really captures the essence of a city. Um, there's so many, you know, individual parts of a city. Um, so I was sort of lucky in that I met Jean-Francois Porche at a conference, actually, and he was super nice. Like, you know, he invited me to his home um, and his studio, which was filled with more type than I'd ever seen. Uh, he has his studio in an apartment outside of Paris, and then I asked to use the bathroom. And um, in the bathtub, there were books overflowing about type, like, because he never used that as his real home or took a bath there. It was a studio, but I remember just being amazed, you know. And then even in his home, like, everything was type, like type pillows, type, you know, like dishcloths, like, like really obsessed with type. Um, but we wrote a grant together. Actually, I was so grateful for the Simpson Center for the Humanities to bring him all the way from Paris to uh, Seattle for a week to do a workshop. Um, and it was a little embarrassing to show him our like very crummy classrooms you see here, like our setup. At least, you know, we have reasonable tables, but we like hang the electrical from the ceiling. You know, the physical plan of the art building is just so awful, <laughs> you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, here he is. And you can see what he did is he divided the students a large class into six groups um, you know and it was great you know and basically within a week they made a typeface so I was amazed I thought if that guy can come and do a typeface in a week like I should be able to do it you know in a quarter like come on so I started doing what he did where okay we divide students in a group here you know and that way you have like more you know manpower essentially they can work on it together so the first uh, group I tried this with was a wonderful group of three women who made this effort uh, for ESSO. I would find the prompts and, and they could choose from a variety of prompts. So 
here's this, um, you know, you can see they would take that sign and then they would have to try to derive basically the capitals and the lowercase from it, even though you'd get some of the letters. So you can see here on the wall, they're trying to work it out. And there's some slightly crazy variants here, but you see like, okay, you know, if this is a cursive E, what are we going to do? You know, so this is the final posters. Like what was nice is different people could make different posters. This one's by Rachel Hobart and this one's by Lacey Verhalen, you know. And so what's nice about this is there's all kinds of little prompts to start from. So then this is the, um, you know, we used the book by Luis Feely and I really like this patisserie thing. And so this was one of the variants that the students made based on that sign. So you can see here, you know, maybe some example of the process. So this is the 11 by 17 sheet in which they have all the letters. And sometimes we do this weird thing where we make one letter like the O a keystone, and then you have to move it so that you're putting it next to each other le letter to make sure the color's right. Because can you see how like the K is too light, for example, the X, you know, usually the diagonals are a real problem, whereas like all of a sudden this L is really dark, you know, so we do these kinds of activities. Again, you can see the crumminess of the art building, you know, thousands of pins, you know. So um, here's like, uh, you can get images from all over the world. This is the Nye's shop, you know, which was created by Adolf Luz. Here's like a fun picture of the students on the final day. They like to pretend like, you know, drawing the letters is hard work, you know. So, and then here is the, um, I follow Jean-Francois on Instagram and he went to the Baltimore Museum, Railroad Museum and shot this picture. And of course, this is an amazing R, you know. So this is the student's uh, version of it. You know, their R is, that is amazing, unfortunately. But it's still good R. It's just that this one's so stridy, right? Um, and then this is actually a photograph of a moving van that was taken by Nick Feltron. I follow him on Flickr as well. And so this is actually just from last spring. Last spring was the first um, quarter that I have ever taught type design all online. And I was super worried about it, but they did a great job. Um, and actually, this is a project uh, from last spring as well. Um, and so I was inspired by um, my uh, colleague, uh, Christine Matthews, works at Studio Matthews. Um, in that introduction, by the way, I've actually never worked for Studio Matthews, um, like, you know, as an employee, although I would like to, you know, Christine could make me an offer. Uh, but actually, we have collaborated on different projects more as faculty members, but they do wonderful work. But yeah, she had the commission to basically do the waterfront park, um, here in Seattle, which has amazing, like deeply cast letters. She said, actually, these deep wedges are part of the process for casting concrete. It makes them easier to remove. So anyway, the students like this kind of weird brutalist quality. So their typeface out of it is called Breuer. You know, so these are some of the specimens that they made for Breuer. Um, I thought I'd show you a little bit of their process, just the detail of it. So see how like here with this R, it's not necessarily wrong, but because it hangs over so far, you get a pretty big white spot underneath it. You can also see at this time, the capital letters were a little dark for the lowercase, you know, here. And then clearly there are places where like the vertex of the X is too dark, for example. And then you can see that little triangle underneath the A is too small, for example, like some the letters have really pretty closed aperture and there's some weird weight things going on where the vertical is not dark enough and the horizontal is too dark so you can see here like okay some of those problems have been fixed there's like a more decisive triangle here like you know the x has been lightened although it's still a little clogged in this area you know and then the aperture of some of the letters has been received yeah Okay, and so the final student project here I'll show you is this um, delivery receipt sign. Even though I spent some time here moaning about the art building, one of the things that's kind of neat about it is there are still sort of examples of hand painted signs around. And this is one actually in the loading zone of the art building. Um, probably a lot of people have passed it and never looked at it, but I've actually always thought it was pretty cool. And I asked once the facility guys, and I guess there used to be sign painters on staff at UW. And so they would, you know, some of the doors around the university have hand painted numbers and so forth. Of course, that's all wiped out now, but I guess it lasted well into the 70s. So I actually always thought this was kind of a cool sign. And so uh, the students did 
take that one up and this is their typeface, which they called workroom sans, you know? So you can see here's the original sign. They cleaned it up actually for this photo and the previous photos, you can see it had like, you know, the marks of age. It probably hadn't been cleaned for more than two decades, you know, and then this is their original. This is a little bit controversial. You can see like a lot of people have criticized this when I've shown them, like they weren't sure what to do about that stressed P. You can see here, you can definitely go in this direction where it has, you know, you maintain that sort of softness and that angle, right? And then we talked about, oh, do we, you know, the disconnect, if we disconnect what we, we do with the P, for example. One of the students working on the project is Philbert. The other one was Ruby, Joe Jang and Annabelle Lee, you know, so they weren't weren't sure, you know, obviously this B doesn't go, you know, it's a difficult thing. Um, and maybe similarly, I guess I feel this is one of the problems I have. I don't know how much to sanitize. I saw on the Alphabet's Instagram that they had this wonderful sign that the actual nut vendor had made himself. See how it's like, you know, it is really nutty. Like I love the sort of cashews and so forth. So I assigned this as well, or they selected it. But I wonder whether we go too far in sanitizing. I find it very difficult to decide, you know, what is, what what is making it more uniform and what is taking away character because you can see here's their original you know kind of quality where it's much more varied and strange you know and then but i must say i did encourage them like neaten this up or this is weird or i would like the you know letters to be more uniform in width and so forth you know so yeah it's difficult okay so then the fourth question this is part of the reason for this title. Like the more I learn, the less I know. Um, like I used to feel I knew the answer to this question. Like what makes a typeface good or bad? You know, like I don't think I know this answer anymore. I mean, obviously, you know, going through this kind of modernist Swiss training, like these were like the big books of my typographic childhood, you know. Um, I know John Rousseau, one of our former faculty members told me he thought this was a ridiculous name. Like all you had to do was like read this manual and that you'd be ready for graphic design, um, you know. Oh, I guess that sh this slide isn't going to show. Uh, this slide shows universe, actually, you know, so that's part of the, um, you know, that was part of the pantheon, I guess, of this, these guys. Uh, okay, so I guess it is sort of showing. I'm not sure exactly what didn't show. Okay. Um, and so, of course, uh, you know, we, I was also aware of Massimo Vignelli, like the guys at um, UC University of Cincinnati also talked about that quite a bit. And he often says, like, look, if I'm generous, there may be a dozen typefaces. I really only need six of them. And he shows them in his book, like, you know, this basic typefaces. And if you've seen the movie Helvetica, um, he says quite strongly that types shouldn't be expressive. And at that time, you know, he's pretty negative about the emigration output, for example, <laughs> you know, and so I kind of learned like, okay, that stuff isn't good. And then these things like we laughed about it, you know, like, oh, baby teeth, when would you use baby teeth, you know, that it, it seemed clear, like, okay, this was bad, right, you know, um, but it is amazing as you become like interested in type, like you see lots of stuff, like there's a wonderful Matthew Carter talk where he talks about um, even the hobos always on the like hated type list. Um, that he rather admires it, <laughs> you know, what I mean? like it's you know it is really quite original. Um, I still never liked Hobo until I saw recently, you know, James and Monson of Oh No Type Foundry, which is a wonderful name, like his redo of Hobo. You know, I mean, it is kind of amazing, especially the second variant, which is called Hobo Rococo. You know, like just the intensity in which he works. You know, plus his playfulness. I like how he calls it like the fonts no one wants or I follow him on Twitter and sometimes he, he says things like, you know, uh, people complain like, hey, when I used your font, it wasn't that legible, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, you know? So I really thought this was pretty amazing. You know, it's, you know, how could you say that that's not amazing, 
you know, I used to think that you could always say like, okay, Comic Sans, like that stinks. Like that's like an easy target, right? And I used to show this example to say like, okay, you know, that is really bad, you know? And then even recently I saw on Twitter, like, you know, Pfizer, who we owe a lot to for the vaccine, you know, they use Comic Sans and they're saying like science will win. And I was like, oh brother. Um, but, you know, even that I have to take back. I don't know if you saw recently that, um, you know, the Netflix has a magazine that they call Q, actually. And it was designed by Luke Heyman and Emily Oberman. And you can see they set the whole thing entirely at Comic Sans. And I actually think it looks great. <laughs> like If you like uh, look at that, they have an online version. Like, it's really fun, you know? So maybe there is no bad type, you know? Um, and then conversely, things that I thought were good, they're still hated. Like, I actually really still like Rotus. When I learned about type design, I realized like lots of type designers hate Rotus, you know, but I always thought there was something quite elegant about it. You know, I see this uh, is a little slow to come in. Like this is the typography book by Odal Eicher, you know, and then over here on the right, I actually am showing Rotus in use. I, I actually still like Rotus, even though I, I think I saw like uh, Eric Speakerman say like Rotus is not a typeface, you know, it is more, it is less cohesive than other typefaces. Yeah. So I don't know. Okay. So the last question that probably um, is a little bit self-promotional is like, uh, what's changed in designing type, like in the 15 years, like, you know, you know, what's, what are the new things, you know? So um, this is actually, what happens is I use the book every year when I teach the type design class. And so when I find something wrong, I mark it, <laughs> you know? So you can see, but actually a lot of these marks come from a wonderful student who we had. Um, this is uh, Peron Tan, uh, who worked with me to act as an independent study. He wanted to make a, um, uh, a redesign of Romane. He is a huge Dutch type fan, uh, Van Krimpen adv advocate, you know. And so he made a lot of those marks for me as well. Okay, and so what's new in the new book? Well, I talk a lot more about the process or the motivations for making a typeface and I show more contemporary versions like this really wonderful like display um, sans here that was made for the New York Times. Um, and then one of the big criticisms of the previous book is not enough about calligraphy. So I talk a little bit more about that and I include more um, you know, elements of calligraphy in, as the basis of letters. And then another big criticism of the book is not enough full sets of characters. So I try to show both spacing and how the type might look as texture, not just as letters, but as text. Um, I include some student case studies. This is actually Perron's case study of reviving Romane, you know, can, so you can see his whole process. And then I went over new letters. Like, you know, a lot of people are like, you know, no at sign. And especially people are like, no ampersand? Why no ampersand? Um, you know, of course, in the last 15 years, there's been huge changes to type technology. And so I went over that as well. And then um, there are lots of appendices now too. So I have like much more further read reading like different books that I've used as well as a full list of all the typefaces used in the book. Um, and so what's kind of nice is like I've updated and went through and it was a great excuse to buy lots of typefaces, um, new typefaces that I love. And it was so wonderful to reach out to people I realized the whole generation of type designers has grown up now with the old book. Because for example, I contracted Sandrine to ask whether or not I could show orientation, her you know, wonderful stencil font in the book. And she was like, oh, your book was the first book I used. And like, this was fairly common that people would be like, are you Karen Chang who wrote Designing Type? Because your book was my first book, you know? So that was super, super wonderful. So I thought I'd close with this little, um, you know, wonderful uh, slide that um, Stephen Coles, who uh, is the curator of the Letterform Archive, let me uh, borrow from his presentation, you know, here talking about like, uh, I just love the way he kind of reset this stop, you know, and this quote from Gunnar Bream, who has a website called Notes on Type Design, which is also a wonderful resource. Yeah. So that's what's new about designing type. Sorry for the technical, um, you know, problems in the talk, but that's kind of the, the, the fini of it. Yeah. So I think we have a little time for Q&A. 
Yes, I must tell you, I absolutely enjoy that. And seeing so many of the people I've known for all these years, Bream was actually the first group that came to the office when I first became executive director. I got this huge Oh, who was that? Bream. Oh, I've never met him. Yeah. Yeah. He gave me this big hug. I had no idea who he was. I was was very, very... So... Oh, yeah. Q&A. Okay. Uh, Any thoughts on the lost art of optical sizes discovered now in variable fonts? Let's see. Oh, I see. So there's a separate tab. I don't usually use this Q&A thing. I think this is kind of a webinar type thing. So Lucas, the lost art of optical sizes. Well, um, certainly I think it's good, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, cause um, there's a great book uh, like by someone else that talks about the size. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's a really interesting book about um, how size affects type design. I can see the cover in my mind. It's like brown and it has like a, a belly band of color around it. I know I like have it in the issue. Maybe people will put it in the chat, in the index. Yeah, that's it. The um, size specific adjustments to type design. You know, like I don't actually know myself much about that. I mean, I feel like I would have to make a whole nother series of diagrams to look at that. But that's actually what they've done. The Just Another Foundry people, you know. Okay, let's go. Uh, in addition to your book, what other resources do you recommend for designers interested in creating type or to stay up to date? Well, there's lots of other great books. Um, Like there's that new book out that's called, I think, Designing Fonts, which I think is really nice. I was just reading that, you know, that it's like got a yellow cover. Maybe somebody will put it in the chat. Like it's more interesting because it's about display type, you know? And then actually, I think there is a wonderful book. um, The one that was written by the three, um, you know, Spanish type designers, you know, the from sketch to screen design. Designing, uh, designing type, like that's really kind of interesting, um, you know, and then the, of course, there's free stuff like Bream's, you know, notes on type design. That's what someone's, um, yeah, there's that designing, um, you know, and then of course, there's lots of online classes now, like the, the um, you know, I think the TDC, don't you sometimes have online workshops, you know, that people can go to. And then there's the Type at Cooper program. And then there's Type West, which is part of the letter form archive as well. So I think it's a much different world than it used to be where I think it was actually fairly difficult unless you would commit to a full master's program and go somewhere for a year, you know, so there's lots of uh, resources. And of course, like, you know, the Typographica website where they have the reviews, I love that. Like, that's amazing. And fonts in use. I think like Stephen Coles essentially is like single-handedly holding up, (laughs) you know, with like a ton of those things, you know? So I guess like, you know, and now instead of typophile, we have type drawers, you know, there's that online thing. And then I would, it'd be remiss not to mention the alphabets, you know, how there's the alphabet girls, you know, like the alphabet second share screens, like they do a great job of, um, you know, they have even a mentorship program. And I know at the TDC, Carol, like you have your, um, you know, like you have scholarships now and so forth, you know, for the type design part. Just extended the deadline for the superscript and the Beatrice Ward to March 19th. So any students that are on this and are eligible, please, it's $5,000 each and sponsored by Monotype. All right, so go yeah. on. So this is the Alphabet's website, and they're just a great group. And actually, they are doing this hangout. I was actually going to go ahead and be part of the hangout on Monday for Women's Day. Like, I think it's like I have a weird time, like 7 p.m., uh, 10, 10 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, so. All right. Uh, so somebody wants to know, so how did you get involved with topography? Um, 
Uh, you mean other than what I described already? Like just with the, oh, you mean because I had the science background? Is that the whole idea? Sure. That was, um, I was actually um, happy in some ways as an engineer, but one of the difficulties of being a chemical engineer in the 90s like that, the 80s and 90s, is most of the jobs were in petrochemicals. Um, and so like one of the big, um, you know, employers of people out of Penn State was mobile, you know, and so I really just could not see myself moving down to Texas and working in petrochemicals. Um, so I uh, interviewed mostly at consumer products companies, and one of them was Procter & Gamble, which happened to be in Cincinnati. And that seemed pretty good relative to the other things I thought about doing, um, you know, because the other things were like, oh, I could work for Cargill and make fertilizers, or I could work for Bird's Eye and make like, you know, frozen corn in Omaha or something. So I was like, okay, Cincinnati seems like a pretty good place. So I went there, and then I started to go to school at night at Cincinnati. They had some evening classes in which you could learn to be a designer. And I interacted with the advertising agency as the client, of course. And so I just wanted to do what they wanted to do. Um, but of course, my parents were like super against this. In fact, I was going to ask them about this um, during our weekly phone call, um, you know, so because I told them I was quitting my job at Proctor and that I was going to study to be a designer. Um, and they, you know, they weren't too happy about that. <laughs> and I was only able to do that because because, yeah, I've been working with a shrink for a long time. Like I've been going to the same shrink for like two or three years, you know, but I decided that it was my life and I was going to do it. <laughs> you know? And so things are fine now. You know, it just took a long time. You know, it took time to go to graduate school. I was on a three year program, you know, and so uh yeah, but that's kind of how it happened. I was always interested. I still remember the day in which I told my dad, maybe I wouldn't study engineering, that maybe I'd study English or art. And he told me flatly, like, I am not going to support you if you do that. And then I struggled for a while, like, well, you know, how will I make it work? Then I was like, okay, I guess I'll just study engineering. <laughs> you know, so these are kind of the obstacles, I guess, <laughs> that we experience in our 20s, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I just the chemist and look where I landed up. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so what do you see coming, uh, changing in the world of type in the next five years? You know, find those questions the most difficult like actually as part of like this bold italic uh you know talk that like there's this kind of neat russian school called bold italic you know and he was like what are the trends i'm like i'm not too good at the trends like i feel like i'm actually still stuck in like me you know, <laughs> like 10 years back i mean it seems clear that like okay now there's this trend where corporations want their own typeface, right? Because then they can avoid licensing fees um, and they can customize exactly to the language sets that they want, right? And so, but unfortunately, all corporations seem to want the same typeface, right? <laughs> like they just want like a generic sans serif typeface that looks good and, you know, pretty compact on mobile. So on one hand, that seems kind of boring and it seems like, well, it's hard to see how that trend will really change. On the other hand, there's like groups of crazier and crazier display typefaces where I feel like that, you know, people vie for breaking, you know, the latest, you know, unbreakable rule, you know. So the display world has gotten crazier and crazier. So I guess maybe it's sort of polarization in that way that you see this like real safety thing happening. And then you see, you know, this sort of real experimentation happening too. But it's hard to say, you know, I don't really know. I'm not good at the future thing. No, I agree with you. Um, could you describe what has changed in your approach to type design as web type has become so prominent? Web type has become, well, basically things are better now. I still remember the bad old days in which your choices were Verdana and Times. <laughs> and that was it. Like you had to rely on system fonts, you know? So the fact though that we can make web type and access it on a server is amazing, you know? So I guess I think web type is hugely freeing, you know? But I don't know that. Um, and of course, you know, the fact that resolution has improved, that we have retina screens and that, it, you know, that gets better and better each year. Like, I think that can only be good for, for type, you know, that basically the screen offers us more, you know, more possibilities than it, than it used to. And let's face it, it seems like 
you know, now there's only certain kinds of books being produced, right? Like, you know, high end books, you know, museum catalogs and things like that. That's one genre of what they're willing to print. Then there's like zine type things where people are willing to like riso and print on their own. But a lot of the other stuff basically has moved to being online, you know, so it seems like, well, just the existence of the internet and the web, you know, changes, you know, what kinds of things get printed and what kinds of things stay on screen. And before this ends, I want to say that there will be one lucky attendee who will get the book, and we will make we will notify that person after the event today. We will go. Through, we've chosen a number, and it's up to how uh, that number and how you registered. That's all I can tell you. It's a big surprise. Karen picked the number, and that's how we'll notify that person, that lucky person. Oh, and I just want to thank Yale then, because like Yale University Press has been like really wonderful to work with. And they said that they would provide a free copy to one of the viewers who come to the talk today. Okay, let's see if there's one other, here's another question. Um, Karen, did you find tutoring online challenging and tiring? Well, it is a little tiring because physically you're rooted in a chair. You know, like it's, you know, normally it was actually really fun to like walk around and see the students work. And then it's kind of fun to see how they do it. Like some of the kids keep their sketches in like Ziploc bags, you know, that kind of thing. But I will say one huge advantage I thought is we use Figma now because of the coronavirus that we're teaching online. So the students can put their letters up, you know, on the Figma boards and very quickly like make words and sentences. So it makes the problem of spacing really apparent early, which is just as important as the letter shapes, if not more important, right? And they can very quickly see when letters don't have the same color, you know, or are there are inconsistencies. So I thought in that way, that was a huge advantage. And then, the, you know, they basically, they're sharing their stuff all the time. So it's like, there are definitely advantages to, to having it online. Um, but I think what they miss, frankly, is the community. Like a lot of the students just miss like bumping into each other at Parnassus, which is the coffee shop in the art building or, you know, like, you know, meeting up in the computer lab or things like that. And, you know, that is important for their creativity too. you know, those kind of chance encounters. So I think the work is still good, but I think the the environment is unfortunately kind of limiting. And it is harder for me to see how they're responding when they don't turn on their camera, for example, like, am I saying something and they're very upset or they're crushed, you know, because I do try to modify my remarks based on how I think it's going. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so that's also challenging. It's after two, but I want to take just one more question. Uh, will there be an online type design workshop for us to sign up in the future? I'd be interested in a workshop like since I've never been to a type design class and I would love to get the experience. One, the TDC definitely will have that. And um, Karen, could you recommend something as well? Um, well, I think that um, the Type West, I guess I tend to think of it out here, but like the Type West letter form archive, I'm pretty sure they have a repeating workshop, which is sort of like a introduction to type design. And I think some of the students, we alumni that we have out there did take that and say that it was good, you know? So, I mean, I'm afraid I don't, you know, think of it that often, but I'd like, you know, I don't look at those things as often, but I see lots of opportunities to do that. Like, for example, like um, I had a great uh, podcast interview with um, the people who run the, um, you know, the God, now the name escapes me, but they're having a glyphs event, actually, a, a little glyphs workshop that was really inexpensive, the League of Movable Type. So they're having a glyphs mini workshop actually um, very, uh, very soon. And actually that looked great. Cause I think it was like 30 bucks and it's like, um, you know, uh, Daniel Nisbet is going to run it, you know? So it seemed like a, you know, an affordable one hour workshop, you know? So that would be a great, I thought like little mini intro if you just wanted to kind of get a sense of it. Okay. Well, definitely out of time and just want to remind everyone we are having a conference type drives communities it'll be two days uh, may 7th and 8th uh, please look for it again we do have workshops karen this was wonderful i asked 
we we need to chat afterwards. And uh, the rest of the questions I will send on to you that you could answer, okay? Oh, okay, great, sure. I didn't know whether I can definitely um, answer them, yes, yeah, separately too. Yeah, thank you so much everybody for coming. It was wonderful to see the list of people, you know, all coming from all over the country and some of our alums too. I really appreciate your support. Judy Harmony, I saw you logged on. You were my first client ever. <laughs> like that was so nice, you know, yeah. Well, thank you so much everybody. And thank you, Karen, honestly, it was, I loved it. <laughs> oh, good. It was really fun talk to put together. Okay, take care, everyone. Stay well. <laughs>